Welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining us, spending the time tonight with us uh, on what I hope will be an interesting discussion about Lucerne. Uh, my name's Ben Wixey and I'm the National Sales Manager for Germinal. Um, there's a large number of you registered and turned up tonight, so that in itself tells us a story that this is an area of, of great interest to a lot of people. Um, we're going to do things slightly different tonight. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation for 15 minutes, 20 minutes about Lucerne in the UK and worldwide and, 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 uh, and where we think we're going with it. And then I'm going to hand over to Chris Ruffley from uh, Harper Adams University, who's been growing Lucerne for quite a while. And uh, he's going to talk about how they grow it and how uh, uh, they integrate it into the dairy diets. And then Simon's going to give us um, uh, his, his appraisal of the situation from his farm at Waikie in North Shropshire, uh, where Simon's developed a very uh, unique way of harvesting lucerne and uh, uh, baling it and selling it as a cash crop effectively. Um, so yeah, slight, two, two farmer sort of uh, interactions with us tonight. Um, there is a survey at the end of this. Please just take 60 seconds to fill it in. It does help us immensely. Um, just let us know whether the whether we pitched this at the right level, whether it needs to be more intense or less intense next time. Uh, other topics that you want us to cover um, uh, and just any comments that you'd like to make. Um, we are recording this so that we can uh, send it out uh, again in the next 24, 48 hours. You'll get a link through on an email. Because there's so many of you tonight, I'm just going to take uh, 60 seconds um, to just uh, introduce you to Germinal, because many of you uh, won't have heard of us. So let me just move on here. So uh, who are Germinal? Well, we are a sixth generation family firm, uh, just coming up to 200 years old in 2025, uh, originally from Northern Ireland, uh, moved into uh, the UK in the 1960s, and this is our um, uh, production facility in Lincolnshire. Uh, we've now another warehouse on this corner and another big warehouse at the back. These are old Second World War uh, aircraft hangars. Um, and that is our production facility where we clean and mix grass mixtures, clover uh, and uh, lucerne and other uh, products that we sell. In 1986, we formed a partnership with IVERS, which is the Institute of Biological environmental and rural sciences at Aberystwyth University um, and there we breed grass and uh, white and red clover. We produce about 4,000 hectares of grass seed a year uh, across the UK uh, on contract with farmers um, and then that is sent back to Lincoln cleaned or occasionally cleaned on farm. Uh, most of it goes back to Lincoln and is cleaned and then uh, my job is to integrate it into mixtures to sell to merchants. We have our own research facility down at Melksham where we trial the different varieties and the ideas, the innovation uh, and the products that we think will work for UK farming and we also trial it on farm. We have a team of people who spend their life on farm looking at different projects, obviously under sowing of maize here uh, and different projects around the country um, to bring you what we hope is uh, innovative and uh, quality products for UK farming. So we don't deal with uh, farmers direct. Uh, we'll only sell to merchants, but we do have a lot of contact with farm and we are working with farmers all the time uh, to try and make things move forward. OK, so on to tonight's topic. Lucerne. Well, perhaps the biggest crop in the, in the world. Uh, I haven't been able to find any exact official figures. But uh, the figures I found range from 30 million hectares to 45 million hectares. Um, it's certainly bigger than uh, maize or corn, as the Americans would call it, um, and worldwide grown from Russia to Saudi Arabia. Uh, one of the characteristics of Lucerne, uh, although it's the same crop that's grown in, these, in those countries, is its dormancy rating. And uh, one thing that you need to learn if you're buying lucerne is what the dormancy of the variety is. Obviously, if you're growing uh, lucerne in countries like Saudi Arabia, where there's very little winter, then the variety would have a very high dormancy rating, an 11 or 12, um, because you don't need a lot of winter hardiness and you need uh, 
quick growth in the spring and then continual growth during the year. If you're in parts of Russia, then the dormancy would be twos and threes, probably just twos, because you've got a very hard winter, a late spring, and you need a lot of winter hardiness in the variety. So although it's the same species, different characteristics. In the UK, we are looking for varieties of between four and five with their dormancy rating. So that's the first thing that you need to check if you're buying Lucerne, is that it's the right dormancy for what we're doing. In the south of the country, I'd be looking or hoping for five cuts further north in Yorkshire, crops there and, and, and further north, then three to four cuts, uh, cuts is probably more uh, achievable. I've we'll talked to you about Aberystwyth and the breeding programs there on grass and clover. We don't breed uh, Lucerne uh, and we've partnered up with uh, 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 Seriens, which is a new word to me, but it's, all, it's formerly known as Euphredrio. Many of you will know that breeder. They are uh, been breeding uh, Lucerne for over uh, 30 years. Um, they have the number one variety in France and a very high percentage of the markets in Italy and Spain, uh, the three largest Lucerne producing uh, countries across Europe. Uh, this is their facility at, um, at Poitiers. Um, it doesn't really, the photo doesn't really do it justice. It's six hectares uh, of, of factory. There's three hectares of production facilities and three hectares of uh, um, warehousing. Uh, they clean crops there for themselves and for other uh, European breeders and merchants and everything there is on a massive scale. Um, these here are three five ton mixing bins for the treatment. Um, and uh, the seed that we supply through um, Sirius or Jufre Drio is either comes to you with uh, no treatment on it at all, so bare seed, or with uh, inoculant only, or with inoculant and uh, micronutrients, which we'll go on to talk to you about in a minute. So that's our partner on Lucerne. And as I say, we bring these varieties to the market through uh, agriculture merchants across the country. So why grow Lucerne? Well, normally the reasons I, I experience when people are talking to me about Lucerne is that the field is out of production. It burns up, it's very dry in the summer and we stop producing grass on it. Um, Lucerne is a way of bringing that field back into production. What we're gonna, gonna present tonight is warts and all. It, it, Lucerne is not the magic answer to everything, um, but if there is moisture in the ground, Lucerne has a deep taproot and is more likely to find it than a perennial ryegrass plant, for example. Um, we can bring ground back into, into production, as I say, that, that, that wouldn't grow decent crops of grass seed. If you've got heavier land that can grow grass, then you grow grass, as far as I'm concerned. Um, more recently, I've had lots more conversations about the high quality protein. Uh, and the scratch factor and the room and health of, of uh, Lucerne and it, that's being focused in the, in the dairyman's mind um, and the nutritionists are telling us that it's helping with acid load, loading in the rumen and improving uh, rumination. Uh, sorry Chris and Harper but Reading University had done some work here that showed us that uh, uh, inclusion at 33% in the diet um, is, is producing an extra two litres a day um, and there's plenty of examples where in trial work, the inclusion of lucerne in the diet is making the room in a healthier environment and then more efficient production from the forages that are also going in there. So it's got multiple uh, benefits. The yield of, of lucerne can be anywhere around 12 tonnes of dry matter per hectare, which if you think of it on fields that aren't achieving that on grass is quite, is quite staggering. Protein content can be anywhere between 18 and 22%, depending on stage of the crop. Uh, when you cut it, um, obviously, if you're cutting it very regularly, you're getting a higher protein crop, a crop but less yield and less fiber. Uh, and, you know, Simon will go on to explain how he cuts it, as I call it, wet, uh, and then uses his uh, drying floor to dry it and actually is in increasing the protein content in that, in that manner. Um, We've had excellent herds, uh, excellent results from herds using lucerne in combination with maize, so that we're getting the protein from the lucerne and the energy from the maize crop. Um, and 
more and more it's becoming uh, I'm interested in Lucerne because I want a homegrown protein. Uh, I want to reduce my costs or reduce my uh, environmental imprint, uh, footprint uh, and using less um, imported soya. So uh, those are the, the main reasons that we talk about when we, when we look at Lucerne. There's also the environmental benefit clearly of uh, it's, it's a legume and it's fixing nitrogen uh, as well as the root aiding with soil structure and the root mass uh, with organic matter in the soil. So uh, my computer's being a bit slow tonight. Uh, where would I grow uh, Lucerne on my farm? Well, the number one criteria is that it has to be free draining ground. Um, Lucerne will not stand its feet being wet. Um, it's got a deep tap root, but any surface moisture or surface water uh, or waterlogging source for any length of time uh, will kill the plant. It's quite simple. Um, we need good levels of pH around uh, six and a half to seven. Anything below seven probably needs remedial action uh, before the crop's drilled. The labs might tell you slightly different than that uh, later on. Um, it can tolerate pH is up to about eight and a half, but too high uh, pH level can reduce some of the elements that we need, uh, particularly molybdenum and boron uh, that the plant needs for uh, the rhizobium and, and nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen capturing function. Uh, so trace elements are important as well. We'd always recommend uh, a full soil test uh, to be carried out in the months before the crop was grown. Uh, and check for items such as potash and uh, calcium, uh, as well as elements like sulfur um, for protein production and uh, magnesium for chlorophyll synthesis. So there are uh, elements that we have to get right. There's attention to detail. Um, and the last thing about Lucerne is we must have a rotation. Uh, the Lucerne crop gives out uh, an exudatant that goes into the soil and acts as an autotoxicity defense, it stops other plants growing too close to it. Um, unfortunately, this means if you have uh, a thinning crop of lucerne, uh, you can't add more lucerne into it because uh, this autotoxicity will stop that, that working. Uh, and we need five to six years break, therefore, between lucerne crops. Um, this also is important with nematodes, eelworms, uh, their numbers increase in the soil with the host crop, as with the fungus verticillin wilt. So as the host plant is there, that number, that population in the soil builds up uh, and we need five or six years without that host plant to let those numbers drop down to their natural level as they occur in the soil uh, all the time. If you do have lucerne that's three or four years old and it's a thinning crop, uh, we can introduce things like red clover to keep the protein content high and to get you that production off that field. And if it is the last year, then uh, you know introduction of even some of the more aggressive grasses, Westerwolds can bump up the production from that crop uh, if it's just in that final year. And I think Chris will go on to talk to us about red clover inclusion as well. Um, so drilling lucerne, well, we need at least 10 degrees C in the soil temperature, which is normally happening about now, mid-May onwards, mid-April onwards, sorry. Um, the establishment phase, as Simon said to me before, the establishment phase is, is critical for this crop. Um, it is a very small seed and it concentrates on root development as it establishes rather than any substantial leaf growth. And this is sometimes why I think it's, it's, it's described as a, as a slow starter. It's, it's important to drill this tiny seed into the best conditions that we can, uh, both in terms of nutrient and moisture. Uh, so spring or autumn drilling, uh, personally, I prefer spring, but it's not always possible. It depends on the needs and the rotation of the farm. Spring drill, spring drilled lucerne will probably mean one cut less in a year. Um, a good little trick to get around that is using a uh, sort of half rate, 40 kilos to the acre of spring barley as a cover crop and then whole crop that uh, as early as you can. Remembering that it's the lucerne that you want for the next four or five years, not the whole crop that you'll remember when it's long gone. Um, the fine firm seed bed is a must and roll tight to aid that moisture absorption into the seed to start that um, germination process. Autumn drilling is, is, is okay, it's fine, it, it, it works well, but by autumn we do mean August. Um, we see it time and time again where, where uh, lucerne is drilled uh, too late into 
into September. Um, and what needs to happen is the plant needs to take on water, it needs to germinate, it then needs to establish, it then needs to grow away uh, and become dormant before the winter sets in. And sometimes when it's drilled too later in September, day length is decreasing, soil temperatures are dropping, and uh, we then have a lot of plant number loss uh, over the winter period. So uh, if you're going to drill it in the autumn, no problem at all, but get it in the ground in the last week of July or August. Um, drilling depth is massively important. As I said, it is a very small seed. Uh, if you're going to broadcast it, fine, but harrow it afterwards and then roll it down tight. We want the seed at about one centimetre depth. Um, drilling is and, and placing it at that right level is, from what I've seen, by far the best results. Seed rates, well, we're looking uh, for about 900 seeds per square metre, um, which we're then trying to get about 400 plants per square metre the following spring. Um, 900 seeds per square metre normally equates to around nine and a half kilograms, 10 kilograms per acre, 24 kilograms per hectare. Um, there are parts, there are countries in Europe that drill up to 30 kilograms per hectare. It's not necessary, you won't, hear to see, you won't hear a seedsman say that very often, but it's not necessary to have a high seed rate if you have those uh, soil conditions uh, correct in the beginning. Um, if you're looking to combine grass with it, um, then okay, but make sure it's a grass that's slow to establish, something like Timothy or Meadow Fescue. Uh, don't try and establish a perennial ryegrass or a Westerwolds or an Italian with it, because they'll simply outcompete the, the lucerne. Um, the argument for growing grass might be for weed control or as a nurse crop or um, for increasing the sugar content for ensiling purposes. And I can see that in the right situation. My sort of opinion is that you're growing it as a protein crop uh, and by introducing a, a companion crop with it, uh, you sometimes can dilute the effect of that protein. Having said that, we've got a load of trials ongoing this year where we're looking at different grass mixtures, different legume mixtures uh, in with the lucerne to see if there's a, um, a decent ratio of plants to get that pro high protein, high yielding crop. Um, but one interesting little trial in Shropshire with a farmer who's, who's put down some clover into the bottom of the lucerne last year, some white clover to try and tie the ground together, stop the stones coming up and hitting the, the mower. Um, so we'll see how that gets on this year, um, just trying to tie the soil together. Seed treatments, uh, as I talked about earlier on, uh, SAS premium seed applied solution. Uh, the premium is our um, uh, cocktail of, as I say, nutrients that we use just for establishment rather than for uh, as a fertilizer. So there's a small amount of potash, molybdenum, boron, zinc, manganese in that cocktail, um, as well as the inoculant. And we need inoculant because the rhizobium that fixes the nitrogen for lucerne is different to white clover. And uh, we, we need that rhizobium in the soil and the best place to put it in the soil is right next to the seed in the seed coating. So it used to be that we used to mix a peaty slurry up, apply that to the lucerne uh, and then try and get that through the drill. None of that needs to happen anymore because there is a, a, a method of uh, pre-inoculating the seed. Uh, and then a new seed treatment this year which we're looking at is SAS Premium Plus, which is um, Mycorrhiza as well. I'll just talk about that in a minute. Varieties that we're using are uh, very high on the French national list. The UK national list for Lucerne, I'm afraid, is, is not in a very good state and grass and cereals and everything else, it's fine. But for Lucerne, it's not, it's, it hasn't been, I don't think there's been a new variety on it for over 25 years. So we tend to look at the French list, um, Galaxy, is a, a fantastic variety, 17 tonnes on the French list of dry matter. This is Northern France, uh, 17 tonnes of dry matter and about 19.5% protein. Um, Milky Max, slightly higher yields, newer variety, slightly higher yields, about 0.3 of, uh, of a tonne per hectare um, with a 0.2% uh, lower protein content, but overall a, a bigger protein contribution. Uh, the new seed treatment, the micro riser, is only available on the Milky Max this year. Um, and the claims are that it's producing as much as 6% higher yield from this symbiotic relationship between the micro riser 
and the roots and basically it's increasing the area of the roots and allowing more water and nutrients like phosphate to be absorbed by the plant uh, and as I say we've got trials going this year to see how that's working uh, in the UK. As we've touched on briefly the nutrient offtake of uh, lucerne is quite large as with any green crop that you're taking off um, a lot of potash is coming off as much as 30 kilograms per ton of dry matter so if you're getting 10 12 tons of dry matter offtake you need to be replacing 300 to 360 kilograms of potash per hectare whether that's in the form of well rotted manure uh, or, or fertilizer is up to you clearly. Um, nitrogen, the plant is a, is a legume and will fix its own nitrogen. Um, if you supply nitrogen to the plant, uh, the rhizobium will stop working and it will stop fixing its own nitrogen and you will need to consistently apply nitrogen. It's not an issue, it's done in, I've got customers in the Cotswolds who do it and use slurry all the time. Um, after every cut, they give it a drink of slurry and, uh, you know, but they have to now keep feeding it because the plant isn't fixing its own nitrogen. And it seems, uh, well, it's one way of doing it, but it seems a pity when the plant will fix its own uh, nitrogen given the chance. But as I say, big, big potash requirement and a big calcium requirement, which is why we need that high pH. Uh, and we would encourage soil testing every year to, to keep that uh, calcium availability up. Um, uh, trace elements would cover belimidin and boron. Uh, for, nit uh, for nodulation and nitrogen fixing zoom mm. for establishment and animal health. Um, so yeah, requirements for those. Cutting, uh, this is where we see the most uh, mistakes that are being made. Um, if you're cutting, uh, if you're cutting a spring drill crop, you probably get one or two cuts in the year. And that's where the under sowing of the spring barley might help with the production figures for that year. Um, after that, I'd expect you to get, like I say, depending on where you're on the country, three to four to five cuts. Uh, and the rule of thumb would be about 70% of your annual production will come from those first two crops. The mistake that we see the most often is cutting it too low. Please don't cut the lucerne below seven centimetres, ideally about 10 centimetres. You can see here, uh, this has been cut at seven centimetres and this is cut at three. And the regrowth is so slow because you're you're cutting out that growing bud that's at the base of the plant and is, is about to flourish and replenish and regrow. And if you cut too low, you take that down. Another little effect of cutting or leaving a longer stubble is allows with airflow. If you remember the old days of swathing rape, you get airflow underneath it and drying the crop is better. Um, the bottom of the plant is very lignified anyway, and that's the only part that the animal can't digest. So. I know it has an action with the fibre, with the, with the uh, room and health, but uh, please uh, don't cut the crown out of the uh, out of the crop. <clears throat> uh, conditioners on the mower, yeah, if you've got them, ideally we'd use rubber uh, roller conditioners uh, just to pinch that stem a bit more than the leaf uh, to help with some of the the moisture loss. Um, 80% of the protein and even more of the minerals are stored in the leaf. So it's leaf capture that's really important in harvesting lucerne, lucerne and the rubber rollers just help to bruise that stem and even up that wilting rate. Um, so if you can't use rubber rollers and you've got conditioners on the mower, either try and turn them off uh, or uh, open them right up so they're doing as, as little damage as, uh, as possible to the lucerne. I'm sure Chris might uh, comment on that later. Um, yeah, mow, uh, mow when you see the first flower, um, especially for the first cut, the first uh, one and two cuts, and then perhaps leave it to flower in cut three or cut four um, to give the plant more strength to go through the winter and get you that spring growth uh, the following year. We are looking to take the first cut perhaps at the beginning of May, might be a bit later this year, although I'm very surprised how well it's coming on now. Um, sorry first cut the beginning of May maybe middle of May and then probably every four to five weeks after that depending on your requirement for protein or uh, or, or high yield. Uh, the Americans are cutting every three weeks. Be careful as I talked about earlier about picking bits of information from other countries. The Americans are cutting every three weeks. 
their crops don't last as long, but also it's different, uh, um, different types of lucerne with different regrowth patterns. Uh, and uh, you know that, that's a management trait that they have that I don't think we uh, particularly need to follow because I think it would affect dramatically the longevity of the crop. If you've only got the crop lasting one or two years in the rotation, fine, take cuts more regularly and have a higher protein cut. And then finally from me, um, on the harvesting, uh, Chris is going to talk about this and what they do. Avoid overhandling um, as that leaf is, is what we're trying to capture in, and every time we handle it, there's more risk of uh, leaf shatter uh, and some of that being lost. And in terms of chop length, we're looking for about um, three to four centimetres uh, uh, for chop length to go into the pit, uh, slightly more for bales, slightly longer for bales. Right, that's it from me uh, from a presentation point of view. Uh, just to make you aware that we have a, another webinar on the 7th of June uh, on multi-species swords. There is a lot of interest in multi-species swords at the moment in terms of protein providing for livestock, uh, um, uh, not monocrop um, diets, uh, drought tolerance, um, and the benefits of the multi-species swords to the soil as well in terms of regen agriculture and things like that. There is a lot of good science out there. Uh, a lot of stuff we're doing at GRS is now coming to, to fruition. We can bring you those results. Uh, there's also a lot of nonsense spoken about it. So uh, join us on uh, the 8th of June and we'll, we'll try and sift through um, uh, the multi-species. That's actually a double header as well. The following week, we have three uh, multi-species farmers who are going to talk for 15 to 20 minutes about their experience with multi-species and how they're using it on their farm. So if you're interested in that and another crop for dry land, uh, then join us for that. Right, um, I'm now going to stop sharing my screen. Chris, over to you. Um, I just have a quick uh, look around. Can you share your screen then, Chris? And we'll go on from there. Uh, just before you, while you're doing that, Chris, uh, would you, uh, one question here, would you mix lucerne with other species like red clover? Yes, uh, we can. Chris does that and he's going to come on to that. Um, but you can bolster up a crop of lucerne with red clover. As I said, because of the autotoxicity, you can't drill more. Um, oh, you've answered that, Chris, anyway. Sorry, I've just seen your comment. You can't uh, add more lucerne to uh, uh, lucerne crops, but you can put red clover in. Right, Chris, roughly over to you. I've talked enough. Hi there, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Ruffley. I'm assistant to the farm manager at Harper Adams University in, in Shropshire here. Um, I think the best way to describe my job is I probably look after everything that goes in the front end of the cow and everything that comes out the back end, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, Harper Adams, we're, I'll just touch briefly on who we are, what we do. Um, we're farming about 1,400 acres, um, roughly about 40% of that's owned uh, and spread over various parts of, parts of Shropshire up towards the Reekin. Um, the main, the key parts really of the farm um, are, the, are the 430 dairy cows. That's probably the, you know one of the, the principal principal parts of the farm really. Um, we've also got 1,100 clean ewes, um, and then cropping wise, about two thirds of the cropping are, are sort of forage crops, which is grass, lucerne, red clover, and maize, and then a third, uh, approximately a third, is arable. Uh, I'll just uh, just just to point to note there really. Um, about 80, 80 acres of the ground is, is lucerne and sort of 35 acres of red clover, just, just, to, just, just for the purposes of this presentation, really. Um, so, yeah, why grow, why grow lucerne? Um, Ben's covered a great deal of this already. You know, he's, he's, he's done a pretty good job of that. But I'm just going to quickly, quickly fire across it again. Um, it's a, it, you know, it's a high protein forage crop. It's, it's one of the biggest crops in the world. Um, and, it's, and it's the reason we're growing it, really. We're not, we're not uh, just growing it for a bit of fun, really. It's... As Ben said, we you know we're typically sort of achieving seventeen to twenty percent um, protein as the, as the crop analyzes, um, and we estimate it saving us around about around about a kilo per day, roughly of, of our protein blend um, per cow, which doesn't sound like a great deal, but if you sort of multiply that over a year, it's about thirty five to forty grand. So it's um, it's quite it's quite significant, really. Um, as Ben said, it's it's, it's a very it's a very good source of highly digestible fiber. Um, but I think the key, I think the key point, I think Ben probably allowed me to notice here, is that it mixes very, it complements the complements maize in the diet extremely well. When we have some sort of high quality leafy grass, we can end up with 
some real sort of balls and you know you know just decrease sort of TMR mixing quality. Uh, we certainly don't see that with the leucine at all, really. I think I think due to the high level of sort of uh, fiber in the in the crop, it, it mixes extremely well um, and creates a great a great TMR. Another great reason to grow it, it's a, it's a nitrogen fixing legume. Um, we, we don't need any, you know, it, it requires zero nitrogen virtually. Um, and particularly, you know, uh, most people are, 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 are claiming basic payment scheme uh, payments and it's, uh, it qualifies as an, for the ecological focus area um, element of that, which is, which is quite an important thing to a lot of people. Um, Following, following the, uh, the sort of five-year stand of lucerne, it's also leaving a, a decent amount of residual nitrogen in the ground for, for following crops. Um, so, you know, a, a, cereal, a cereal following lucerne is, is probably going to do very well and, and have decreased input crops. Due to, the, you know, due to being a, um, having a, you know, a significant tap root and it being very deep rooting, it's also building the organic matter of the, of the ground, which is, you know, is a very topical thing at the moment, really. And finally, you know, we, we go for a four cut strategy and we're achieving around sort of 12 tons, probably 15 tons per hectare of dry matter as a maximum. So it's any sort of misconceptions of it being a, a low yielding crop, I would, I would dispute wholeheartedly. So yeah, site selection again, you know, Ben's covered a lot of this, but we'll just, we'll just skip through it quickly. I think my, my key point on this, um, and I, it's something I drive home to a lot of people, it's it really aim for a free draining soil not even free draining, but just, you know, something that doesn't, I, th I think the emphasis has really got to be on ground that is not prone to water logging. We've, we've had a couple of, a uh, couple of bad experiences with that and Lucerne's done very, very well on some sort of heavier ground and it will do well in, 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 in a dry summer, it'll do extremely well on, on, on heavier ground. But if it sits waterlogged in the winter, it, it won't regrow. So I think you've really got to avoid, avoid wet ground, but anything that's going to drain fairly well and isn't going to, isn't going to lie wet in the winter, you'll be fine. And actually it'll be a benefit. You'll see on my next slide, it'll be a benefit to have it on some slightly stiffer ground sometimes because you won't get, um, I think the best way to describe Lucerne, it, it's, you know, it's drought tolerant. It's not drought resistant, but it's definitely drought tolerant. It's certainly more tolerant than grass or, or most other crops that you might, you might grow in its place. Um, as Ben said, you know, pH is very important. You know, I sort of said 6.2, Ben, Ben said 6.5. I think it's just, you know, it's, it's critical to get that right beforehand. Um, Calcium, that's obviously essential for nodulation and, and, and nitrogen fixation. I think if you've corrected the pH beforehand, you're very unlikely to have a, have a, have a, have a calcium deficiency. Uh, P and K, yeah, around about sort of uh, uh, indice two, and you'll be okay. We uh, here at Harp will we'll always, I think that without fail, we'll, we'll always drill the loose in the spring, going into a rising sort of temperature, around about 12 degrees, and we've had you know, 12 degrees soil temperature. We've had we've had very good results with that. I think one of our challenges here really has been has been forming a forming a stale seed bed at a drier time of the year. So we'll aim to form a form, you know, create the seed bed and leave it about sort of three weeks and and, and spray off with a bit of life state any any uh, any weeds that have come. But one of the one of the critical problems is if it's very dry, they, those weeds don't come. Um, so I think that's you know, try to try to get in there early, try to get the, try to get the seed bread prepared early, get it consolidated, lose as little moisture as possible really, because we want, you know, we want as many weeds to come and, and take them out. So we don't want them competing with the loose and doing. Um, and, and, and as Ben said, around about 900 seeds per meter squared is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty consistent seed rate, trying to, you know, trying to achieve that sort of four or 500 plants per meter squared in a year to two years time. I think, you know, a key point here is you're only ever losing loose end plants. It's not going to sort of tiller out like grass and, and, you plant the plants are decreasing from the day from the day it's established. So um, I'm going to quickly just jump on the next slide, and you'll I think you'll um, yeah appreciate it. This was a couple of years ago, a few years ago. We had a very very dry summer, and that's on probably the lightest part of the farm. Um, and it just shows that it's not it's not drought resistant, but it is but it is drought tolerant. Um, that's a bit of an extreme. So harvest, as you can see, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, we've got. Um, the, the same sort of roller, roller conditioners that Ben's alluded to earlier on. Really trying to be as gentle with the crop as possible. Um, so much of that protein is in is in the leaves, and we've got to retain we've got to retain as much of that as possible. Going in with a with a with a standard mower, I think the best thing to do is either have roller conditioners or, or have no conditioners at all. Um, thrashing thrashing the crop and, and losing all the, losing all the leaf, we may as well just be going grass or 
or, or you know, we're, we're going to have a lot lower protein content, and that's that's not what we're after. Cutting time. Um, you know, the early bird stage really is, is the critical time. People say around about sort of 10% of the crop flowering. I don't quite know how you judge that, but I, from my point of view, as soon as you see a, as soon as you see a flower, you want to be cutting it really. Um, you've got to be, you know, it's got to be warm, it's got to be sunny, you don't want any rain on the crop. So if there's a flower there and it's dry, just, just get the mowers out really. That's, that, that would be my, my advice to anyone. And, and really we're trying to go for this sort of four week, four to five week uh, cutting cycle. If we start in mid-May, we've got, to, we've got to be doing sort of four weeks to, to achieve that by mid-September. We're targeting sort of 35% dry matter. Anything dry becomes very hard to consolidate and anything wetter, you risk, you risk the, um, the lucerne becoming very butyric and um, just losing all the characteristics that we're actually striving for. So, yeah. As I've said there, you know, an additive is absolutely essential. It's, it's a high protein, low sugar crop. It, need, it needs a hand there. Uh, it needs a hand trying to, you know, getting, getting, getting it to stabilize as soon as possible, really. Um, We'll always, we'll always use a, you know, a high quality additive and, and we, have, we have great results with it really. Uh, well laid and compacted clamp. I think clamp management is, is, is quite an obvious thing, but certainly wants, certainly wants noting. Really just not trying to shove the stuff in as, as quickly as you can, but, but getting, it, getting it right, doing it well. Um, well laid in the cramp, so 20 centimeter layers and, and well rolled. We have no issues at all with the, uh, you know, the, the pits are, are, are very clean and tidy. We, see, we have very, very little, very little spoilage. Cutting height is a tricky one. I am. I'm going, to, I'm going to say you know seven to ten centimeters. It doesn't want to be any less than seven at all. Really, ten if ten if you can. That's quite. A, it's quite a tricky one to do though, really without without having some extra skids on the mowers to lift them up. Really, my strategy is just to have the mower level, and that seems to achieve probably slightly less than ten centimeters as a, as a cutting height, which definitely works. So feed. So what are we doing with this stuff? We you know we're trying to. Um, the end, the end, the end consumers on the right hand side there. As we've, you know, we've seen earlier, it's a, it's a highly palatable feed, it's a high protein feed, and it definitely stimulates the, the intakes of the cows. As you can see in the picture there, it, it's a well mixed, it's a well mixed diet. There's no balls visible. It's pretty consistent. The cows are doing, you know, very little sorting. Um, if you see down there, just a touch lower, our our ration uh, that our nutritionist provides to us. As a hundred percent is is using about fourteen kilos of, uh, of forage dry matter per cow per day. Pretty consistently, we're doing these cows are eating sort of five to ten percent more than that. So we're we're well, you know, we're well into sort of fifteen kilos plus um, dry matter intakes just from forage alone per day, which is which is pretty pretty decent, really. So I'm gonna yeah, just quickly jump onto any of the key uh, my, my sort of key points really. Um, nutrient offtake. Do, do not underestimate, do not underestimate lucerne. A lot of people will tell you it's, it's a crop which requires no nutrients. Just because it'll grow with no, no nitrogen does not mean, just because it requires no inorganic nitrogen does not mean it does not need any fertilizer. Ben's already just pointed out how much, uh, how much potash it requires. Our, our, um, our fertilizer regime really is to try and apply about 80 kilos of potash per cut, prior to each cut. Um, and I've just had a quick look in RB209 earlier. <clears throat> there's, no, there's no direct um, indications for, for lucerne itself, but it compares it to a, to a, to a grass silage, really. And on a sort of four-cut regime at 30% at dry matter, the offtake is 7.2 kilos of, of, of potash per fresh ton of, uh, of lucerne harvested. So if we work that through, it's about 300, you know, if, if, we, if, we, if we're hitting that sort of 12 to 15 tonnes of, uh, of dry matter a year, you know, so, so sort of 45 tonnes of fresh wheat per year per hectare, that's 324 kilos of potash per year and actually works out pretty, pretty close to what we do at 80, 81 kilos uh, per year. So you, you, you absolutely cannot uh, underestimate that. And similarly with phosphate, it's, it's a much lower requirement, but it's still, it's still significant, as you can see in the figures there. Incidentally, quite a lot of our, our P indices are actually quite high. So I think this year we've only actually applied phosphate to two fields. Um, so that's that's one just to just to be aware of the that, that, those P and K requirements. They can either come from from an inorganic source or they can come from an organic source. Um, we are trying to use as, as little as little inorganics as we possibly can, really. Um, so so utilizing utilizing you know well rotten manure is is um, absolutely possible. But the key there is it really wants to be well rotten. Doesn't want to be a lot of readily available nitrogen in there at all. 
um, for, for the reasons that Ben's already mentioned. We actually, I'm going to say, we actually use zero in organic M, you know, for obvious reasons, which Ben has already covered. Um, the, only, the, only, the only nitrogen that that crop receives that it doesn't fix itself is, is the slurry that we applied before, you know, in, into the um, into the seedbed before it's before it's drilled. Um, next point, really, yeah. So allowing the flower to allowing the plant to flower once per year, absolutely key. It kind of goes against all the other things I've sort of mentioned, but what we find here really is in the third in the third cut, it's always around harvest time. We've always got a few other things on our mind, and actually that's the time just to let just let the crop flower. And that just lets it put a lot of put, put some reserves back into the roots and lets it get going early on in the spring. So I think what you really lose in that in that third cut, uh, in, in terms of maybe a touch of quality, actually pays dividends the following spring because the crop's got enough got enough reserves to get going to get going early on. A number of years ago, we tried under sowing and the tender loom. We sowing with, with barley. We actually went with fifty kilos of barley. Um, and I think the main well, the two main benefits of that really were it suppressed any weed any weed issues that were could have potentially been there but it also gave us a pretty good first cut off the um when, when we when we got around to the first cut Be a big issue really is compaction there's two things lucerne absolutely hates and that's compaction and waterlogging now we've, all, we've already covered waterlogging we're aware of that one but compaction is, is a really a key it's really a key thing you've really got to try and avoid this um i think you know a sensible chopper driver decent trailer drivers we're just taking you know being careful not driving in the same place all the time I'm just trying to reduce compaction as much as they possibly can decent flotation tires on every machine and um, just trying to reduce that compaction because you know as you're going to see in a couple of couple of pictures time it will not it will not stand up to compaction at all um, it will just you know, the loose end will sort of just disappear and that's where I come on to red clover really red clover is equally a um, you know an, an, an excellent crop and you know superb silage really it's right up there with lucerne um and a few years ago we actually tried including a couple of kilos per hectare of, of red clover of other claret seed in the in, in with the mix and i think my main my main issue with that really was just to try and just to try and see what happened really we've actually already had a question about that haven't we um just to see what happens you know so it's, it was really a look see and which which grows better but actually what i can see that that you know the companion crops they, they grow really really well together they complement each other the first cut the, there's always a lot of a lot of red clover in there it's consistently the highest yielding field we've got um but i think the key the key points i really wanted to note with that and if you look in the picture here on the right hand side the red clover definitely stands up to the compaction far better far better than the lucerne if you look in the right hand side of the picture it's all it's all lucerne if you look in the left hand side of the picture, there's obviously a bit of a wheeling or a tram line or something's gone on there. And that whole area is filled in completely with red clover. Um, if you know, we had a look at walk on that field earlier on today and it was there, there's no patches. It's I think it's in its, it's in its fourth year now. It's going to be coming out next year. But actually that, that red clover is just just filled in those patches. And there's, there's very few, very few sort of um, very few sort of gaps. Um, I think I think a key thing here, which we, we will probably look at in the very, very near future, really, is trying to probably trying to direct drill some red clover into into a weakening crop of lucerne on, on, on headlands and on stiffer ground. You definitely end up you definitely end up losing plants. We do. Um, and really, whether the, you know whether it's possible to 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 drill the red clover in, into that existing existing crop, I think would be a great way of rejuvenating, rejuvenating the lucerne, really. Um, ben might tell me something completely different, but I think it's definitely worth having a look at. It's definitely a great idea. So yeah, that uh, that wraps me up really. Thanks very much for listening to me. Um, I look forward to your questions. Um, right, could you stop sharing your screen and Simon can uh, share his. Um, just one comment here. When applying well rotten farmyard manure, is it pre-drilling or each year? Are you putting uh, farmyard manure, Chris, on the, on the crop every year or is it just into the seabed? In the uh, so we'll always apply uh, manure, whether that's 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 FYM or slurry to the seedbed. Um, quite often we'll be forming a sort of windrow of some of really the separated slurry from the, from the dairy, really, and just leaving it out there for a good while, and then we'll apply that straight after a cut. I think the key thing is really apply it when when you can apply it. If it's dry, if it's very dry, very the ground's very firm, get on, get it, you know, get it on the day, you know, straight after the forage has come off the field, really. Um, 
and it just saves it just saves you a pass for the fertilizer spreader, but really it, it utilizes the manure that you've got um and tries to just reduce reduce that sort of bag fertilizer that you, you're purchasing. Yeah. Okay. Simon, do you want to share your screen? I'll just take sure. one comment or question uh, while you're doing that, Simon, if you set yours up. Can uh, lucerne be made into hay or is it just silage? Yes, it can be made into hay, um, but it's the weather pattern, Chris, isn't it? I, I, I would say that it's it's very difficult to, um, to to have long enough in this in our conditions to and the heat units to, to make it into hay. So silage is by far the more uh, common um, uh, common uh, common crop that's used. I think there's quite a there's you know a bit of uh, quite a few people making making lucerne hay. I'm not sure how how decent the quality of it would be once you've been through that tether. Um, it's entirely possible. They definitely do it in France. Um, I know on a re recent trip to, well, we went to Jufre quite a few years ago and we went, we visited a farm and they had a lot of loose hay, which was being, which was being fed to goats. To me, it looked very, um, looked very stemmy, but it's, but it's certainly possible in this country, it'd probably be quite a challenge, but, but absolutely possible. Yeah. Right, Simon, how are you getting on? Okay, well, if I... Click on that one, that's it. Is that it? Can you... Yeah. And then if it comes up at the last slide, you just need to... Um arrow back up or, or that's it just just left, or left arrow or that's it uh, ah previous is it yeah if you just use the left arrow on a keyboard okay sorry yeah no worries it should just take you back to the top hang on you're still on uh gotcha there you go there you go right okay Ready to go. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Ben and Chris. Uh, very interesting. You obviously done quite a lot on the actual growing of, of, uh, of Lucerne. Um, I wanted to perhaps talk a little bit more about what possibilities there are for markets. And it's quite pressing you were talking about hay because that's basically what we do here at, at Waikiki Farm. Um, one apology, firstly, for the quality of my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I sort of learned it today and obviously I haven't learned it very well yet, but I hope it, hopefully it's uh, readable anyway. So anyway, just we are WH Kittens and Sons. We're right in Levin Towns. Uh, we live quite close to Ben um, in North Shropshire here. Uh, we're fourth generation family business. We farm about 3000 acres, half of which is owned. About two thirds of it is in one block. Um, half of what we do is cereals. Uh, we rent some ground for potatoes. We grow beet maize hybrid rye for our digester, and more recently we've got into forage rye, lucerne, and we're going into timothy this next year as well. Uh, we're irrigable, we're predominantly like sandy loams. We were early on the anaerobic digester job, we've, we're in our, about our 10th year now, and following on from doing that, we uh, went into um, renewable heat in terms of ground source heat and using the heat from our digester, which we can. Um, discuss as we go along. Okay. Um, right, yeah, so I lose um, um, Now, Ben, can I ask you uh, if I just take this? Yeah, you just go down to pointer options. Yeah, gotcha. And then go to the laser pen. I just want to take off the laser pen. Yeah, I just click on laser pointer again and it will take it off. Gotcha. Right, thank you. So yeah, um, why Lucerne? Well, it started really with the, the AD. We built the AD 10 years ago um, for the electricity, but then we wanted to start to using the heat. You get a, a kilowatt of heat for every kilowatt of electricity you get. So we thought we would use drying floors. And so we built our first two well vent um, drying floors uh, to utilize the waste heat from the cereals. Uh, if I can just zoom this down the yard a bit. Uh, yeah, so this was an old potato store and we put in two um, drying floors, well then drying floors. There's the one there. Central tunnel is on your left uh, and another the other side there. We've now put two more floors at the far end of this shed. This was in the winter, so we're drying some wood chip. Um, it's been, it was worked very well uh, with the AD heat um, and we do all our cereals uh, on that floor. I'll just quickly show you the digester, which is if we zoom out. Uh, here we go. So those are the pipes leading from the digester, the heat coming to and from the uh, 
uh, the the engines, and uh, there we go. There's there's the digester. So it's 1.9 megawatts, three engines, a March's biogas plant. It's been really good, and um, as I say, it's it, it took brought us on to the to the journey that we are on now, which is drying uh, drying lucerne. So we did our cereals that worked well. We thought, what else could we dry? And our research led us on to lucerne. Why lucerne? As we said, it's the biggest crop in the world, 74 million acres. Why is it so tidy in the UK? Well, the answer is the weather. 70% of the protein is in the leaf and the unre unreliability of the weather makes haymaking a lottery. Uh, and the more you turn it, you're just leaving all your protein uh, in the field. So what's the answer? Well, you take weather out of the equation. Uh, in the past, this is what happened. So back from the 1930s to the 70s, uh, grass and lucerne drying was huge in the UK. This fell by the wayside in the 70s with the oil price increases. And that sort of coincided, I, I think, really with the expansion of silage and soil products. And along with it, the increase in the use of concentrates uh, going forward to bring in soy in from South America and the like. So the picture here is of a big drum dryer. There's probably less than 10 producers left doing this in the UK. And the big problem is they, they're of a scale where they have to use a lot of um, fossil fuels. So they're either using gas or in some instances I've seen uh, actually coal still, would you believe? Uh, that means it's very high cost and therefore they rely on premium markets. So they're really looking at the small animal and the horse market. So we looked at this and we thought, well, can we avoid using fossil fuels and make it more efficient uh, and cheaper to do? Uh, and the answer for us was um, ground source. So we'd seen that we could use drying floors to dry lucerne with our AD heat, which is a low temperature heat, about 40 degrees C coming into the heat exchangers. Uh, and we can provide that with our ground source heat system as well. So the picture here shows four containers. They contain 24 200 kilowatt heat pumps. Uh, so that's 4.8 4.8 megawatts, uh, and that's the, the water is provided from about six and a half hectares of underground pipe, about 65,000 meters, 1.2 meters below the ground, and that recircles all the heat back to those pumps. It's concentrated up using electricity from the AD, uh, and that heats those three drying floors at the back of those uh, of the sheds there. So it's RHI compliant, which means the actual drying is a business on its own. So that's a profit center in itself. Um, just going on to sewing, um, I, I won't go into it because we've talked about it a lot, but our view is always to do it in the spring. Uh, you'll notice here, this isn't Lucerne, but this was actually earlier today, about three, three o'clock this afternoon. So what we tend to do is we will take a cut of whatever we're growing. In this instance, it is um, forage rye. Um, so this forage rye is coming in at about three tons of dry matter per acre at the moment. <clears throat> and we just use a mower and grouper, which we use for the lucerne. It's nice and gentle. It's nice long cut. That's going to the, the drying floors from here. We'll, we'll, we'll wilt it for two days because we can with this. And when the drying floors are empty, it'll be onto the dry, drying floors and it'll be dried for a week, baled and out. Um, this field will then be ploughed, stale seed bed, as Chris said, which is very important, and it will be back into Lucerne within about four weeks' time. Uh, so that's just the product, just to show you what this is what's on the floor at the moment. That's the um, uh, forage rye, which will then be baled, and that's going off to, to Genus for their, for their bulls up in Rookie. Uh, so the markets that we're looking at, um, as I said before, the, <clears throat> the, the guys who are producing it are very high cost producers and they're trying to aim at those sort of horse and pet markets and partly the poultry market, which is, you know, big, big money. Obviously you've got to get it into pellets or to small bales, but it is, is big money. Uh, my view was, can we do it efficiently to hit the dairy market at a profit? And I think by using renewable heat, we can, and we've proven that. Uh, and last year, uh, we're selling at 220 pounds this year a ton. Last year, we were 200 pounds a ton um, for about 24% protein product in, uh, in quadrant bales. And we could have sold out four or five times over, I'm sure. Um, the, you're really up against Denji, who are predominantly bringing it in from Europe. And this year, they're more around the 270 pound a ton mark, 
which is pretty difficult. But um, I, I guess that reflects the increase in the in soya price, which you're they're, um, uh, pushing against. Um, we talked about the poultry. Um, there's a huge potential in the poultry market. Uh, about 20,000 tons is used, I reckon, across or camp or will be used across all of the um, broiler and hen market. The picture on your left is what is currently being used. This is a bale, a 20 kilo bale that comes in from Desai in France. Uh, I think it's sold by um, typically by uh, Lloyd's Animal Feeds or Denji. Uh, and I say that's about 430 pounds a ton. The chickens just peck away at it. It's good for their health, their, their um, digestive system, and it stops them pecking each other. This is what we're looking at doing. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but we've done some trials with making briquettes and hanging them in the same way. And that seems to be working really well. Um, the, the chickens peck away at it and uh, they last a bit longer than the bales. So that's something we'll be looking at doing and or people can look at doing in the next two or three years. Um, harvesting, uh, we use the mowers that you saw before or a triple mower sometimes, just gentle, no conditioning whatsoever. We're mowing it, grouping it, uh, and we're picking it up typically within 24 hours. And you really do notice the difference if you go over that time in terms of the leaf you see flying around. Um, so we wanna get up to, we're getting first cut products can be up to like 25% protein because we're able to capture all that leaf and get it into the, into the shed. So we're using a pot in the forage box there no knives at all, we take those out, you get enough uh, fracturing and um, it's very brittle uh, in, in, the, in the drying process when we're turning it to enable us to, um, uh, well, we don't want any more of that than necessary because then it, it makes it uh, difficult to get it into the bale. So that's, that's how typically we bring it in, straight onto the floor. So this is last year, probably first cut, so we have five drying floors. Each one will put on about 50 to 60 ton of wet produce at about 25% dry matter typically. Um, so that will that floor will hold about 50, 60 ton and it will go down to about 12 ton. So you're chucking off a huge amount of water um, and that will take about um, six to seven days. Um, so, as it comes off, we then need to get it baled. Now, initially, we didn't know really how to do this. So all we did was we took a, a, um, a tub, tub mixer and just laid it out along the concrete uh, on the farm and just ran up and down with the baler, which was hugely time consuming, weather dependent and, and, and quite difficult. So we looked around and we found this um, machine in the center here. I don't know if I could turn the... Can you still hear me now? Yeah. 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 Um, let's see what I'm So this, I'll have to talk, talk a little bit. So this is a machine we found in Switzerland. Uh, in Switzerland, they grow, they do a lot of cheese making without using any um, silage. So that's to get high omega-3, typically Gruyere cheese and the like. So they have hay barns and you may have seen these hay cranes. And this is one of the machine, machines they use. So it simply sits in between the tractor and the baler. You've got two rotors here that feed it down uh, across, the, across the, the, the draw bars onto a conveyor and that feeds straight into the, uh, into the baler. It's worked really, really well. As you can see, it takes the, uh, the material very, very quickly. Uh, you can probably do, if you had two or three loaders up to about 20, 25 tons an hour, but we'll do it a little bit less than that. Um, I'll just move it on a little bit. So there you can see it feeding through. Um, so there's the finished product. So as I say, there's six, six string, 500, uh, 500 kilo bales, which will then send out on curtain siders in 20 ton loads to uh, to dairy farmers around around Britain, um, and it, it works very well. This was two years ago. We've now moved on to we built a shed to do it in, and we've put a built a conveyor to go under it 
to collect all the fines that drop out below it to save all this dust from blowing around that we're doing at the moment. So I feel like that, if we just now, I'd just like to do a few, look at a few costs with you. Now, apologies for the size of this slide, um, but I will point as we go. I, I couldn't get it, I couldn't work it out to make it any better, unfortunately, but anyway, here we go. So cost, firstly, the first cost you've got is establishment, um, which you spread over four years. So we've got seed, we've got fertilizer, Fertilizer, we just use solid digestate, which is, I think, really, really good for lucerne in that it's got a huge amount of potash uh, and the nitrogen that's in there is not readily available. So from my simplistic point of view, you, you apply it at the beginning of the year, the plant can't access it straight away, so it, it has to fight and it will produce more nodules. And so you get the benefit of the nodules and potentially the benefit of the nitrogen later on as well. So we put typically about 10 ton of solid digest on, digest it on per acre. A bit of crop protection to get the stale seabed, uh, plow power, harrow, combi drill, roll. So that takes you up to 192, which is, we take it over four years. That's about 48 pounds a year. Um, and then you've got your annual costs. So your mow and forage box, 40 quid a time, I'm thinking. So about 160 quid, a bit more crop protection, which might be cultural, uh, it's going to be more cultural over the next few years with the loss of products we've got. So we may use a stubble rake just to extract some grass. Um, you know, the lucerne crop is so strong and so hardy, it will take the grass out before it, it really damages the, the lucerne plant uh, and our fer annual fertilizer. So one hit of solid digestate at the beginning of the year or, or as soon as we can, and then that's, that lasts for the year. Uh, so that gets up to 253 quid of fixed costs there. Um, direct fit cost. The yields, um, so year one I've got three tons of dry matter, that's after what we saw before, after the forage rye, so you've already got three tons of forage rye, dry matter, so that makes you up to your five, six ton a year. Uh, in years two and three you get your best yields, sort of five, five and a half ton hopefully, and then possibly back down to four, four and a bit, and as Chris said, a, a lot of that loss really is the hammer you get around the headlands and, and just traveling on it. Um, so the other costs we have, which is different to other people, is the baling and turning costs, which are on a cost per acre, sorry, cost per ton wise. So which gets us, if you ignore the first year, of a, of a cost per acre of around about the 350, 375 pounds a ton, uh, and a cost per dry product, so or cost per dry matter of between 75, 80 pounds a ton which I think is, um, is very promising and, and, uh, and obviously we're, help, we're lucky in that we've got the digestate, but I think it is um, a very good crop to grow and, um, and it certainly works for us. And if you imagine if we're selling, if we can produce, if you compare it to wheat, say three and a half, 3.7 tonnes an acre and we're selling at 170 perhaps pounds a tonne, if you can produce four to five tons and sell it at 200 pound plus at a lower cost, um, it's got to be a, a positive. So I think in conclusion, what I say is that, you know, you may think, oh, well, you've got the heat and you've got the drying capacity, but I think there's going to be a lot more options going forward. And I would ask, suggest people look out for that. Ground source, I think, will come back. The government will want to do more interesting things. There's solar, there's solar heat, which is very interesting and other things as well. So. I would look out there to see if you, you can access heat um, to do this sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you know, we're using, you saw the baler, that baler is going, we'll be starting tomorrow and we're getting use of that baler right through from April, right the way through till September. So it's helping our fixed costs as well. Uh, and uh, this year we'll have our first wheat crop after um, Lucerne and it, it so far so good, it, it looks very well. So we're certainly sold on it. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Back to you, Ben. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Um, right, we have gone on longer than we intended. We thought between us we'd do about 40, 45 minutes and we've gone well over the hour. Um, so let, we'll just do uh, a few quick questions. Um, um, uh, chop length, somebody's asked about chop length. 
Uh, well, weird, Chris. What are you, what are your sort of uh, opinions on shop length? I mean, I'm, I, I I talked about three to four centimeters. Yeah, we're we're sort of going twenty to twenty five mil, really. We're really trying. If, I think if you could achieve twenty five mil consistently, that would be yeah, yeah, that'd be ideal, really. And I think I think from what I've what I've learned, the the the, the more inclusion in the diet, uh, the shorter the chop length needs to be, um, and, and we we'll stop uh, fair with stop sorting and things like that as well. So yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, is there a variety of lucerne suited to the wetter climates in Ireland? Um, uh, I, I don't think it's about the variety of lucerne. It's about the soil type. As Chris said, you, you can grow lucerne on heavier ground, but it has to be free draining. Um, it's not about the amount of rainfall that falls on top of the crop. It's about how, how much of that water sits in the ground uh, around the root structure. If it's not free draining, Lucerne is not the right crop for you. you. If you've got heavier ground and a lot of water, uh, look at red clover and grass. I think the lucerne will do. The lucerne will do well in um, on some sort of heavy heavy ground in the you know in the summer in a hot summer it'll do very well. You'll you'll get great yields, but it won't survive the winter. So it's no, it's it's not it's not a long term. Option. You get a kind winter, you're okay. I'm, I'm not sure you're going to get a kind winter in the west. You know, Ireland. most of the ground I know in Ireland is it, 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 fairly heavy, and, and I wouldn't put lucerne on it. So. <laughs> I would look at red clover as a protein uh, crop there. Um, Simon, are you using any of the um, lucerne in your AD plant itself? Have you tried uh, that? At the moment, or we're, we're not. Um, we Now that we can take the fines off, which drop below the baler, we're putting that in, which is, which is very high in protein. Um, but the idea is to sell that as a, as a separate product to um, the poultry farmers or even the food mills as a high protein um, dust effectively. Okay. Um, uh, I'm just trying, there's so many questions here. Um, uh, Chris, can you just talk about, or both of you actually talk about um, any benefits you see to the following uh, arable crops? You know, it, it, obviously there's nitrogen and fixation. Are you seeing anything in terms of soil improvement or anything like that? I think there's some probably some uh, some, some hidden benefits really. Um, I, I think the way the uh, the root structure of the, the lucerne probably really really breaks the ground apart. It's you know it, it, you do wonder about direct drilling cereals and, and, and whatever in, into lucerne in, into past lucerne ground. Really, I think you probably still need to remove a bit of um, remove a bit of compaction somehow. But um, we we just find to be. Honest, we just tend to find, you know, cereals do very well afterwards, really. Um, you know, whenever we have ploughed over ground, you literally see these slabs of, of, of and lots and lots of root coming over. Um, so I think nutritionally, it'll, it'll, it'll be a huge benefit, really. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think well, we're fairly early in this, Chris. It's probably, the, we've just got our first wheat crops after it. We did plough it, which I'm sure a lot of people would think that's terrible, but I just don't, we weren't confident on how to kill it properly. Uh, and I think that's something we need to learn, um, whether these cross cutters and things will do, and a, and a couple of sprays will do it, I, I don't know. Um, but certainly that it should have done everything for the soil. It's um, to, to help it, you've lost your weed control, you've taken the weed bank out, um, the, you know, you've got vertical, structures in in the soil rather than horizontal so yeah we're, we're very much looking forward to seeing what it will do okay um here here's one for you guys what, what are you doing in terms of weed control pre and post emergence is is there anything you can do uh weed control pre and post emergence so i think the key thing to do is try and avoid any weeds in the first place and that's why we go for a stale seed bed there's very there's very few chemicals available um very 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 few uh, we do we do very little. One one thing we actually tried years and years ago now, really on a on a quite a mature crop, was actually straight after it was cut and it was probably cut too short. We actually applied a, a liter of glyphosate. I don't know if I should say, should say that or not, but um, that was actually very very effective at a, a very low rate. But I wouldn't like to try it on a on a, on a decent crop at all because you've got those new shoots and when you've got a couple of green leaves, it's just going to take the loose end out. But um, I, I not a, we. I think our crops tend to be clean enough that we don't actually need to use anything. Um, Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I think, Chris, the, the um, stale seed bed is vital, isn't it? And, and then it's the cultural thing is that you, you're cutting it consistently. 
So you're taking away any problem and it competes so well when you've got it, which is the key. If you've got it there, it will come out, compete most things and you're cutting your problems away. Yeah. Right? After a first cut or two, they tend to look very, very clean, to be fair. I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot to be gained from a bit of red clover in there, really. We've, um, the, the field that's got the red clover in it ours, it, it, it's, ex, it's one of the cleanest, the cleanest lays we've got and also one of the oldest. Um, that probably wouldn't apply to the headlands, but it's, I, I think the clover just, you know, creates such a canopy that very few weeds, very, very few weeds appear. We'd obviously suggest that you'd have to use a red clover that would last for the duration of the, of the, of the, of the crop. Um, something like Abaclara, which you mentioned earlier, um, you know, it, it lasting that little bit longer than, um, you know, some of the some of the more European varieties that would only last a year or two. Yeah, we've, we've um, also got a, um, you know, a, just a straight field of, of Abaclaris, and there's literally zero zero weeds in it. It's and, and how often are you cutting that? We digress a bit. We cut it. We cut it with the lucerne. We cut it at the same time as the lucerne. Yeah, and then we put it in the clamp at the same time. We did. Apart from last year, we actually bailed the last the last cut, and the bales are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. Right, last question on that sort of subject then. Um, uh, this is from Geffen. Uh, I see that on the slide that it says additive use is essential. Is this a specialist additive for Lucerne or does a conventional additive for grass, will that do? I'm not sure if there are any specialist ones for Lucerne. We, we just use a, um, a standard grass. Well, we use, we use a ballot biosal, what was biosal additive really? Um, yeah. Which is now Lalaman. But uh, yeah, just, just I think you, you, want to, you want to look at something that's got um, that's targeted at putting at a higher dry matter, providing you are getting getting a high dry matter forage, really. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, just just those those um, uh, with a sort of Buckner eye bacteria, and they, they seem to do they seem to do very well. Uh, we we get no issues with it at all, really. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, best techniques for rowing up before baling and foraging. Either of you. Oh, so I, uh, I I actually missed that out on, on part of my slide. There's actually a, quite a key point, really, and quite a key thing about the whole the whole process of making this prepare. And um, we actually have a three day policy where, effectively, just cut it short. We we will go out on the first day, we'll mow it on the first day, two mowers, uh, as wide a swath as possible. Then we leave it. We leave it the second day. We don't go anywhere near it, providing the sun's shining. The third day, some idiot around here goes out at about three o'clock in the morning and tries to row it up while there's a load of dew on the crop. That dew just holds holds the leaf together, holds the crop together. Assuming it's been well wilted in the second day, you know it comes together very well. You see no, you know you see no dust, and that dust is is, is leaf. It's all it's all protein, and it's always the same. You get to about sort of half seven, eight o'clock in the morning if it's a, if it's a decent sort of July August day, and then you sort of see that that plume of dust start to start to appear really. So so really that's a key thing really. Cut cut day one, leave day two, row up as early as possible on day three, and 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 get chopping after that really. Yeah, and that just you know it's all aimed at trying to trying to trying to trying to achieve that dry matter. Trying to you know it, it, to me it needs sort of forty eight hour wilt. You, you've got to achieve that sort of 35, 30 to thirty five percent dry matter um, to make decent silage. Um, and then yeah, then yeah, yeah, just try and keep, try and keep it all there, try and keep it all together. Good. And Simon, are you rowing up at all, or are you are you laying it down and picking it up with the wagon? No, we don't. We don't try to touch it as, as little as possible. No conditioning. Just um, we will. Um, merge it, uh, leave it there, and pick it up the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both very much indeed. I'm going to wrap it up there because it is it is quarter to nine, and we've been going on for over an hour and a quarter. So, thank you very much both for your time. Thank you everybody who's been tuned in. Very good numbers, and thank you for that. Uh, there are still a, a lot of questions that have been asked. Um, some of which we've covered, but some of which uh, I'll cover tomorrow in uh, in the email. So thank you all uh, for spending your time with us tonight. I hope it's been interesting for you. And again, thank you to Simon and thank you to Chris for your time and, and knowledge. Thank you. thank you very much.